Welcome to MicroWorth Talks. I'm your host, Xavier Gallego, VP of Brand and Marketing, and I'm delighted to take you with me on our journey to grow the future of materials. Thank you for tuning in. Today we are going to talk with Sachin Jain, Principal Scientist and Mycologist, and Phil McGoy, Research Assistant and Mycologist here at MicroWorks. And uh, we will focus our conversation around the HBO show, The Last of Us, trying to figure out what's fiction and what's real, ways that you can eliminate the infected that are not with guns. And also we'll fantasize about the season finale that's coming next. So stay tuned. Let's get started. Hello, we're here with Phil and Sachin, and we're about to discuss a lot about The Last of Us. Are you excited? I'm excited. I'm excited. Cool. Nice. Well, the reason that we are here together is that uh, we all love the show. We work at MicroWorks and goes, what? We work with Fungi, no? Yep. Yep. <laughs> and we are like very familiar with it. So there's a lot of things that we want to talk today. We want to talk about what's fiction, what's reality. We want to talk about the role of Fungi in, in the entertainment industry or like even the perception that it has uh, across. And, and I brought both of you because you come from different backgrounds. Um, I don't know how to explain to the audience your background. Maybe like the best way to do it is if I ask you the question, when was the first time that you heard the word mycelium? Well, I'll go first. This is Phil. Uh, for me, I remember reading or being in a bookstore and going through the new nonfiction releases. I was doing that for a, a good amount of time in the mid-aughts. And um seeing this book called Mycelium Running by Paul Stamets. And it was probably like 2006 or something, 2007. And I think that stuck with me. I really was like, I picked up the book. I was really impressed with it. It was about mycoremediation, all things, you know, fungi and, and, and how they can be beneficial to us. And then about a year or two later, I went to see Phil Ross speak at the Oakland Museum. And it was about uh, building, it wasn't necessarily all about building houses out of out of fungi and mycelium, but it was very mycelium based, and I think that was right at the late aughts. Wow, yeah. so it's been a while. Yeah. What about you, Sachin? Yeah, so I it goes back to my undergraduate degree actually. So I was studying biotechnology as a major, and I took a microbiology course, and I entered this lab. It was a immunology lab actually. They were using Aspergillus fungus to study asthma and allergies. So it was my introduction to mycology was really through medical mycology, looking at diseases uh, and stuff. And then it was really until I joined graduate school in Wisconsin, looking at plant pathology and how fungi play a role in plant pathology. You know, a lot of crops and diseases happen on our soybeans or sunflowers and really fell in love with all the beautiful colors and morphologies that comes out of this mycelium. So really, you know, at from that point onwards, I was just fascinated by these organisms and how diverse they are. They can go from infecting insects to uh, infecting plants, but then also do a lot of useful things for us. Like, you know, we make bread, we ferment things like koji rice is an Aspergillus species that gives us koji. So it's really fascinating to me uh, how diverse these fungi are. And how diverse your backgrounds are, <laughs> even though you like the same things, no? Yeah. Yep. It's so, so crazy because... I, I know a little bit about Phil. You have your own uh, champignon room at home. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, you grow your own stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you coexist with the organism? Somewhat. Um, it's a little bit of a forced coexistence, but I do it willingly. It's just good to kind of be in contact with them and, and kind of see how they develop over time and checking in maybe a couple times a day. So I, I do, you know, you have to take a good amount of precautions and make sure spores don't get it, you know, you don't let the organism get too old. It's, Keep like, it's almost like your baby. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, also, you're not you're, wrong. <laughs> Sachin, you, you, you've been observing it uh, through microscopes and studying. And yep. it's just crazy that you have all this academia now, yes. uh, that background that uh, probably feel you just don't no, have. No, like no. You, you were mentioning before that some people are just saying the names that you don't, <laughs> you don't have. Yeah, I mean, there's there's almost like an observational pre-science, and I say that lovingly. I don't, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't say that like flippantly. Yeah. But there's there's a there's a certain naivete and wonder that comes like before you know all the science, and I think 
um, I get away with that somehow, and I stick around the R and D facility. <laughs> yeah, and they like me. So, so, so t tell me more about what you're doing now, Sachin, at MicroWorks. Like, what what are you observing? Uh, what is your expertise? Yeah. So, yeah, I would love to share that. I think it's been very fascinating to see that we are reverse engineering our product to understand the basics of it now. Like people like Phil and Phil Ross have developed this technology that we can grow this mycelium macroscopically. But now I get to come in and kind of see it under the microscope, like you said, and see how the hyphae looks like under the microscope and how we can actually explore that mechanism and diversify our strain portfolio to understand can we explore more about this biology and do genetics on it? And like things like I can look at from the lens of a geneticist now instead of just uh, architecture or and, artist. And, and just for context, what's a hyphae? Yeah, so hyphae is a singular strand of a mycelium. So mycelium is a collective name for these individual strands of hyphae. So one, one individual strand is called hyphae or hypha. What a name. Yep, <laughs> I like it. It's cool. I think it's like a hip hop or or yeah. rap. Uh, yeah, you know, no. Yeah, yeah. What is that? What is that feel? I think it's like a Bay Area type of sound. Um, it's so I, cool. I, I I think yeah. I know it when I hear it, but I'm not. I'm not well, positive. I think. And I thought you knew. Yeah. Well, um, so I, I want to ask a few questions because you know through the show um, they did a great job. I love it. Um, even the intro is super cool. Like uh, it looks like kind of like our five mycelium video with all like the <laughs> threads coming in, the high fees yep. mm -hmm. going bananas. Mm -hmm. But th there's like a, a few things that I, I bet a lot of people are questioning: Are we threatened by mm. fungi? Do you think that the fungi can infect us? I think the sh the way this show is portraying is obviously a little bit extreme and maybe a little bit far fetched so obviously it's more fiction than science at a at a certain point but like i said i just started my career as a medical mycologist so we already know there are some fungi are able to cause infections but those infections are more either skin infections or if your immune system is compromised at that point they can start infection but in general, we don't see these fungi taking over the way it's shown in the show. And it would take, you know, thousands, if not millions of years of evolution to be able to adapt and be able to start infecting humans the way they are portraying. Okay, good to know. We're safe. Because, uh, I mean, Phil, you're living with it. So far, you, you look okay. No champignons coming on your face. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. There's another thing that they uh, talk about that uh, is fascinating to me. And this, um, I think it's the, second, the end of the second episode. Ellie comes inside that building and steps into uh, an organic matter that seems to be mycelia, and it's connected to the network, and all the, the infected ones come and, and, and try to infect them. Is that true? Can mycelia communicate? Yeah, that is what I've been led to believe. But yeah, and there's a couple of books out. What's that woman, uh, the, the mother tree? She made a, it was in a Nature magazine article. I think what she did was put some chemicals in the forest floor and noticed that from one tree to another, she could isolate the chemical composition and some compound was delivered from one side of the tree to another tree. And that's been pretty much studied and verified, yeah. So it's almost like the internet on the ground. Right, yeah. They can transmit substance. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've even got it down to, like, maybe the mycelium knows when you're walking on the forest floor. There's The compaction of the soil could be, like, translated to one part of the mycelium to another. So. Wow. So how, how big can that be in terms of extension? It can be miles and miles long. I think the the one that Phil's talking about, I believe, are mycorrhizal fungi. They form this network with the roots of the plants, of the trees, and they form these connections through the roots and mycelium roots, mycelium. So that's an extensive network below ground on, in the forest. But I, cordyceps specifically, may not be able to form that kind of network. So I want to make that distinction. Not mm -hmm. every fungi can form that kind of network that can run miles and miles long. And they have to be physically connected, either through roots or through their own mycelium. Like the way they're showing in the show, sometimes I thought they're trying to say, it's one building here, he, she steps on it, and there's another building somewhere else that may not be physically connected, but they're somehow awakened. That may be a little bit far-fetched, mm -hmm. but I think, yes, fungi can form miles and miles longs of network, but they have to be physically connected to be able to respond. 
Oh my God. And though, those, that's filamentous fungi, like the, yep. the white rot fungi that we work with. There's another kind of fungi, which are like the whole one celled organism, which are yeasts. And those are actually a little bit more dangerous to us than, than any bicidiomycete or any kind of. Um, why, why are they more dangerous? Um, well, there's, there's don't, that. Don't scare me, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to sleep tonight, you know? <laughs> and those, those are what we were talking about before, which are like the. Um, like thrushes and skin rashes, oh, which like yeah. the, the Canada oris or yep, yeah those. So those. there are some fungi that can be maybe uh, creating rashes and, and and skin infections and, but that's that's mild. Uh, it's not that my face is going to be covered of my, with mushrooms and my mouth is going to yeah, explode with mycelia. I mean, in the kingdom of fungi, that's probably like comparing like a lobster to a kitty cat. Yeah. I mean, it's just <laughs> really far away. It's really different. So, Phil, mm -hmm. is the best way to kill the organism by bombing the city? No, I don't think so. Why? We, uh, well, so mu fungi like things that are falling apart. And <laughs> basically, <laughs> if you bomb it. Yeah. I mean, when a tree falls over, there's new opportunities because it's now this thing that's unorganized that it can take advantage of. So if you're going to bomb a whole city, that's going to be lots of things that are now like, you know, ripped apart and opportunity for spores to land on new wood. That's freshly opened up that, that things can grow on. So fungi like things that are just destroyed and we'll take advantage of it. So did we mess it up? <laughs> like did we took the wrong decision. <laughs> yeah. I that, wouldn't bomb it. No. Oh yeah. And Sachin, I have another question. When the, the infected tried to infect another person, you know, the mycelia comes from their mouths or they can be bitten. There's some sort of a, a zombie-esque way yeah. to do it. Is that the way that um, the fungi, you know, go through the world? Not really. So I think it's a lot of, you know, fiction and dramatic effects they were trying to show. But in, in real life, the fungus usually like to spread by spores. You know, the mycelium grows, it forms these fruiting bodies, and that is what you see on these uh, humans in the show as well, like all these mushrooms coming out of their body. And those mushrooms will contain the spores that are released into the air, and those spores can land again on the uninfected to start the new infections. And that's how in the forest or in nature, spores can travel long distances. There's actually people studying the velocity and the how far they can land to find the new host or a new substrate to land on and start growing mycelia again. And, and Phil, to go back to the, the bombing question, mm. it's like, what's the best way? If you imagine that it's 2002, you're in Indonesia, the military yeah. come inside the room and say like, you, you're a mycologist, come here. How we can kill this? <laughs> freeze it. <laughs> Just <laughs> freeze, slow freeze it down. down. <laughs> what, what, what would you do? Or, or spray a bunch of H2O2. Um, do you have a, Sajin, do you have any... I think, like I said before, bleaching the area, like, and finding the source and kind of autoclaving it or heat killing everything that came into contact with to limit the spread and infection. Hand sanitizer, oh, yeah. everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, if you, you would freeze it to slow it down, but you really kill it by heating it up a lot. Yeah, we autoclave our yeah. substrates to. So maybe what that's what um, the mycologist was trying to do, like bomb it, but to burn it. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. It's now coming back to me that one of the reasons why we don't get sick by, by fungus a lot is because we have a really internally hot temperature, like 96.8. And that's one reason why we will, won't get infected by mushrooms and, and most uh, fungi in the world. This new species, the, the, the Canada auris, has mm -hmm. now adapted to it with, the, with climate change to be able to withstand higher temperatures because of global warming. And so now that organism is a little bit more like, hey, it's on the radar. Don't, you know, don't get in at that into your bloodstream. So global warming actually can speed up these kinds of incidents where One reason, we can get infected. Another reason to be, yeah. to care about the planet. That's right. So yes, fungi don't evolve. Right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So when we were talking here uh, with the team, like we, we all watched the show. Right. Mm -hmm. And the first episode, I remember Mari uh, commenting on it and say like, hey, I saw this show. You have to watch it. HBO. It shows my cilia. <coughs> so I watch it right away. Mm -hmm. And then the second episode starts with a moment that kind of like, I don't know, somehow I got nervous. Like that moment where there's this military guy in Indonesia looking for a mycologist. 
And when I heard that we're my colleagues, it was like, oh my God, we made it. We are, we are outside, <laughs> you know, like it's the first time in culture that I see the word mycologist. So it, it, it was a little bit like funny to me, like a funny feeling. How did you feel about it? Similar, yeah. I, I felt seen. <laughs> and I was like, usually I'm sitting in the back of the room, nobody notices, you know, like, oh, I studied fungi. And people are more concerned about maybe bacteria or viruses causing an epi- pandemic. So that felt really, you know, encouraging to see that people are, you know, talking to a mycologist and they're looking for it and they want that information to be revealed. So that felt really, you know, crazy, crazy and unbelievable. We are finally mainstream media is talking mm-hmm. about fungi. Nice. How do you feel, Phil? Uh, I felt I felt kind of like almost in an odd way, partially in a small way, responsible <laughs> because like we started up, you know, microorgs together a while back, and now like it's entered into a mainstream kind of consciousness, and you know, with with help with the pandemic too, kind of like helped this show become popular. But that plus, you know, companies like microorgs have have kind of pushed uh, mycologists to the forefront. Yeah. Wow, yeah. is a, a highlight. And and I was thinking, like, the other thing that I thought it was like, imagine that they come to my works and they say, like, can I talk to a mycologist? I'll be like, <laughs> I'll be looking around the room. It's like, okay, go there. Like, you have probably five <laughs> to pick yep. and choose. So it's it's really cool to to have that that expertise in house and and how we've been from Phil Ross to now, today yourselves, like with a team um, that we know so much and and we know so little. Right, yep. which is fascinating to me. Like I, every time that I talk to a mycologist, it's like we know one percent of it. Mm-hmm. It's just fucking yep. scary. Anyway, from where I am, it always like looks like mycelia of fungi is being portrayed in a negative way. And I, I wanted to talk to you all because you're coexisting with it. You're almost like it's your baby, Phil. Like, and you're looking at it every day. Like, yep. um, how does it make you feel? Like, there's always been, and why? Why fungi has always been the bad guy? you know, instead of the fun one. I, I know that it's like the heritage is completely different, especially in, uh, in, in medicine and in, in certain parts of the world. But like, why we always go to fungi and it's bad? Yeah, I think it starts really early on. Like when you're growing up, your bread goes bad, it's moldy, you throw it away, right? It's always associated with death and destruction. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, food is going or rotting, it smells in the fridge, back of the fridge, then you throw it away. So it really starts early on. So you see that growing up, you feel like associate fungus being a bad thing. You don't want to get it. You saying shower every day because you don't want skin infections. So I think it starts there. But like we are seeing now this total opposite where people are doing so many positive things with fungi. And I myself, when I went into plant pathology, I looked at forest fungi are doing so many fascinating things. Their colors, their dyes could be made from it. Now we're making materials out of it. So it's really, we're taking a turn. We, we my colleagues always knew there's a potential, but we didn't have that awareness and investment, I guess, to say, into exploring that positive side of things. So I think... Can I, can I put you on a spot? Sure. Can you tell me a couple of things that people will be fascinated by? Like, what are the two things that you like the most about fungi? You mean in a positive sense, right? Yeah, like, so of I think, course, please. <laughs> <laughs> Enough negative, right? So I think food is one thing that's really fascinating to me. I think mycelium as a protein source and food, we are having a lot of biotech companies now starting to explore that avenue. And we knew that there's and there's so much protein in, in mushrooms and mycelium in general that we are starting to use that in mainstream industry, food industry. So that's going to be one change. The other thing is really fascinating is I have friends working in companies that are exploring it for medicine, right? The antibiotics, the famous penicillin came mm-hmm. from fungus. And let's not forget that. That saved the world. And now we are at a verge. We are actually starting to decline in new antibiotics. And we are starting to dig in these wild you know, organisms or fungal organisms and exploring their genetics to find those clusters or metabolites that may be hidden that we cannot explore because we just didn't have the tools you know, 20 years ago. Now we have this genomic information, this ability to dig into that genetics and find those uh, molecules that could cure cancer mm-hmm. or AIDS one day. Okay, that's good enough to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know I, I have a dream that um, on the, the TV show, on The Last of Us, the way that they overcome the, the cordyceps, like the infection, is with another fungi. 
So that's the only way that they can balance the force, you know? Yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you imagine like now the the the, the last episode like it's going to be the, the finale season one finale it's going to be uh this weekend how do you imagine that it's going to end i wonder if there's going to be some environmental change that kind of that, that happens in the earth or they find out if we make it colder or if something happens with the environment that that, that humans can manipulate to make it go away <laughs> i don't know that's 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 my kind of fantasy ending but Yeah, I think they could start exploring what they have been trying to show. This uh, Ali character, you know, is sort of immune to it and maybe I'm hoping they will start to reveal because, you know, Joel is carrying her so far to be able to, you know, provide her to somebody who can explore how we can make a vaccine or like a medicine from her blood or something, you know. We don't know. Like I think since the beginning, I think they've been sh- saying that she's immune to it. So I hope they will start to do something. I don't Yeah, know. it's interesting how in like I think episode 3 that she's trying to cure the the, the oh, right. Sam, I think the yeah. name is Sam. <laughs> yeah. With, yeah. With she her own her. blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like it was really beautiful but sad at the same time. So I was like, yeah. oh, maybe maybe that works, mm-hmm. but it yeah. didn't. Yeah. It didn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fascinating show. I think they did a great job. I'm personally really excited. Hopefully we can see more of it. No, what do you want to see next? Like now that we have a TV show based on cordyceps, like what is the next <laughs> thing that we that we want to look <laughs> on TV? But I, I love the relationship. I love how like the, the mycelia is there, but like you don't see it every every episode. No, that moment where the mycelia comes out of the mouth and the color palette that they use for that is that oh. real? Is that the actual? Because normally what, the way I'm seeing mycelia is white, but they portray to yellowish and reds. There can be pigments, you know, released, but yeah, you're right. Hyphae is usually either white or just transparent. Mm-hmm. Like I think that pigment usually you see in slime mold, which are not true fungi, but the the in the numbering, the seed they show this yellow mycelium covering the forest. Mm-hmm. That's actually slime mold, so there can be pigmented uh, cells uh, that can color the mycelium. So a lot of times, as the mycelium is growing through the the substrate or the thing that it's eating for nutrition. When it gets to a certain point, or you know, the environment changes to a a place where the uh, organism wants to pop up through the ground and and sporulate, um, those areas where it's in contact with the air, uh, the organism will change colors as it gets older, as it experiences different temperatures. Um, there's these all these factors that are environmental that changes the color of the fruiting body. So it might be that it could be yellow and yeah. reddish because it's inside a body of a human. Oh, you know, yeah, the fiction is the fiction is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they're not too far off. <laughs> no, it's so, <laughs> so much fun. Yeah. So let's let's finish with a positive note. Like we've been talking about, you know, the show a little bit, mm-hmm. and we all like it. The the fiction and the the truth. What is my course? What are we, and this company doing to change the perception of fungi? I mean once I think when we make materials out of it it's just at one time it's an admission that things have to change and we have to make a better kind of product that's not so impactful on the world in general and so that's one thing that's it's kind of like dispelling the negative like aspects of what fungi is in in the popular media and putting a new spin on it from you what I'm hearing is that by bringing objects or by bringing mm-hmm. materials by bringing things that people can build mm-hmm. instead of destroy uh it will change the perception i hope so sachin do you have anything to to add out of yeah that's really fascinating i think i'm i've been a vegetarian my whole life so animal leather oh, yeah. was always you know things yeah. things that we didn't use or, or, or you know stayed away from and now thinking we can use a similar product by but using fungi and making fungal leather is really 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 fascinating to me and like encouraging for the humanity in general and giving this out to people and to have them try it on and feel that they can have a product without going that route of making animal leather is really will have a positive impact no matter if you use it or not i think just having that idea out there is going to be change the perspective of common public who's watching the show They always think mycelium as a negative. Now, like, oh wait, I also have this hat out of mycelium. So that's that's it. That's yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. The story that we always hear from people that starts on my course, many many cases that they come from industries that were trying to kill the organism, <laughs> and we are trying to grow it. Right, like it's yeah. it's just like uh, cultural moments, like The Last of Us, help us mm-hmm. 
to bring the story, our story and the story of a lot of the companies that are trying to do things with uh, fungi that are really interesting to the world because I think that the only way to the next question uh, is if we understand nature and we, and we know how to use it. So the question is, and you both are different mycologists, mm -hmm. are different styles, what does sustainability mean to you? I think it means whatever you think is possible and probable and something that you can live with for a while. <laughs> Just something <laughs> very open. It's very open. But, I mean, if you can, if you, can in, you know, put something out there into the world that isn't going to hurt you and your loved ones and you can live with for a long time, then it's probably, that's going to be at the heart of what's sustainable for you. The loved ones. Yeah. <laughs> you mean that the... the Your partner and the champignon room? Well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it encompasses, you know, not just a small little microcosm, but... Oh, yeah. yeah. Sustainability to me has always been coexistence, coexisting with organisms, microbes, animals, ourselves. Like, as long as my existence is not harming other living beings, I have fulfilled my sustainability role, right? Like, I think that should be our aim to strive is, like, that's coexist and be in harmonious way with the nature. Yeah. The way it's intended Ho to. Hopefully we're doing, a, yeah. we're doing our little step from yes. here. You know? <laughs> well, it was a pleasure to talk to both of you. You know, my colleges, I found you. There we You're go. here. <laughs> What should we do? Should we bomb the city? <laughs> so it's a pleasure, and I hope that I can talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Chevy. Thank you, Chevy, so much. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed it as much as I did hosting it. We are thrilled to have you with us in our journey. So if you want to learn more, please follow our Instagram page at MikeWorks for our latest news and more. This episode is being produced by Maddie Nathans, sound editing by Carney Ballardo, content editing by Chanda Aloto. <laughs>